said, well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you all so much for joining today's session on communicating to a lay audience, turning your research into a compelling message. Uh, the first installment of a three-part research communication training series that the Futures Career Hub at Johns Hopkins University is organizing in spring 2022. I'm Dr. Christine Kelly, the Associate Director of Futures, and today I'm really excited for us to be joined by a well-known researcher, science communicator, and TikToker, Dr. Ben Ryan, who will be facilitating today's workshop, where he will cover strategies to break down complex research projects into their most accessible and engaging elements to integrate them into spoken word pitches or scripts to support content creation through a variety of platforms online. We're delighted to be joined certainly by not only Dr. Ryan, but also a range of participants at Johns Hopkins and other institutions globally. Thank you all. Um, so really looking forward to turning the floor over to Ben, but before I do, let's take just a moment to get to know him better. Dr. Ben Ryan is a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University, working in the lab of Dr. Robert Malenka. In his current research, Ben is investigating how social experiences in early life shape the development of the brain and how psychedelics alter various properties of social interactions in adulthood. His PhD research explored the genetics and neurobiology of autism spectrum disorder, and he was honored with the Dean's Award for Outstanding Thesis Dissertation Research. Outside of the lab, Ben shares educational science videos on TikTok, Instagram, and Billy Billy to an audience of more than 800,000 subscribers. His videos describe breaking scientific discoveries, teach fundamental neuroscience principles, and debunk viral videos containing misinformation. He also offers career tips for students through a video series called Science Tips and leads the Aspiring Scientist Coalition, a community organization providing free guidance and mentorship to students in over 75 countries. Thanks so much, Ben, for being with us today. Thank you to our participants. Really looking forward to a great session. And with that, Ben, the floor is all yours. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, first, let me just do a quick audio check. Is my sound coming through okay? Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, Futures is awesome. I've really enjoyed setting all this up. You've all been fantastic. Um, as you mentioned, so we're gonna be talking about uh, communicating research to a lay audience. Um, this uh, this presentation is, is largely oriented toward students potentially interested in the empower your pitch um, competition so we're going to be talking about using like a three minute time frame but also it's just going to give general tips for uh explaining science and to people who don't who aren't scientists or people who are not in your field so a lot of scientists when they give talks will start off with like conflicts of interest and things like that i'm going to start with a few disclaimers um one my dog's in the other room barking so if you hear that i apologize Two, I just moved into my new place and I'm sitting at my desk for the very first time. So if I look weird or awkward, I'm trying to figure things out. Apologies for that. Um, and third, I'm on Pacific time. So it's seven in the morning and I have my coffee here. So if, if I'm uh, struggling for words, please understand that that's, that's why I am a morning person though. So, okay, let's go ahead and start off with, um, okay, let's see my, okay, great. Sorry, PowerPoint wasn't working. All right. Um, just some overall workshop goals. So like I said, um, I wanna share my tips on how to effectively communicate science to the lay public. That's the challenge. My dog's really letting, uh, letting you have it. I'm sorry if you can hear that. Um, we are going to help you build a short, clear pitch describing your research. So that is a main goal here, which is uh, hopefully useful. Let's give you a start. Um, provide insights and advice on the use of social media specifically for science communication. So SciComm, if you see that abbreviation, science communication, um, as mentioned, I'm on social media. I do a lot of various things on there. So um, talk about my experience and, and what I've learned. We're gonna perform several thought exercises and we're gonna consider using different approaches and different timeframes. So I'm gonna start with a knock-knock joke. Just kidding, it's not actually a knock-knock joke. I wanna know who's there. Um, so if we could launch a poll, um, I just want to know, I want to start by asking who is, uh, with us today in terms of like, what level are we graduate students? 
Yes, thank you. Everyone's getting in there immediately. I love this energy. Wow, you are working quickly. Awesome. Okay, so that was really fast. Um, 31 up there, okay, 32. So, okay, good. So we are largely graduate students, which makes sense um, because I assume that this event, and actually we'll ask Christine and Roshni, th this event was promoted in the context of the um, Empower Your Pitch competition. Yes. Okay, so, and that is designed for graduate students. So it makes sense, okay, but we do have some, some staff, some faculty, uh, postdocs, grad, uh, masters and undergrad. Okay, cool. All right, and then if we could go on to the next poll, mm -hmm. um, asking about what discipline everyone's coming from. Okay, cool. So predominantly biomedical sciences, engineering, and education. Excellent. I'll give another few seconds. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Um, so we can, I'm not sure if I can control. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, so it's really nice to meet you all. And by the way, wherever you are comfortable, um, I would love it if everyone or anyone would um, turn on their cameras or turn on their microphones. If you have questions, feel free to shout them out, interrupt me. I will not be offended. You can also put them in the chat. Awesome. I see some cameras turning on. Thank you so much. Um, I'm using two screens again. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm like trying to figure out where my mouse is. But okay. So I will keep an eye on the chat, but um, if there's any messages in the chat and I don't see them, just like keep peppering the chat so I notice. So, okay, now I just want to close this and introduce myself. <clears throat> so I feel like it's important to to explain like why um, my advice should mean anything and and also explain the the potential biases that I may have from the specific work that I do. So as mentioned, um, First, I'm a postdoc at Stanford in neuroscience. So I come from the biomedical sciences. If I were to take that poll at postdoc, neuroscience. Um, I'm also a science communicator, as mentioned. So I got I started off on TikTok up top here and then moved to Instagram. And then I actually got involved on Billy Billy, which is uh, essentially the Chinese version of YouTube. And uh, it's the website is completely in Chinese. I had a third party that would add subtitles to my videos and... Um, you know, run the whole channel for me. It was completely in Chinese, but so it's kind of cool. I have over a hundred thousand followers on this, <laughs> this Chinese platform that I actually can't even log in or control. Um, but it's cool because they want to promote science communication in China. So I use various social media platforms. And uh, I also in 2020, I won my university's three minute thesis, which as you may know, the empower your pitch competition is sort of, um, a, a recreation of the three minute thesis where it, but it's allowing for more creative freedom. So um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm used to working in 60 second timeframes and longer form timeframes and three minute timeframes. And also um, for last year, I won this neuroscience pitch competition held by the Mind Science Foundation where you submit a grant and you, you write out of the grant, then you submit a video where you explain your research um, and then normally in normal conditions, you actually go to San Antonio where their, their headquarters are and present your research in sort of a TED talk format. Um, and th this year or last year, they had a, a video submission and then they voted. Um, but that was a longer, so that was like a seven minute video. So, and by the way, that is open. So if anyone's interested in applying for that, please let me know. They're great people. So this is sort of my background and, um, and again, my biases. So I'm, you know, I'm used to working on TikTok. So keep that in mind. So, sorry, I'm having trouble with my uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so let's get right into now the educational portion. Part one, framing your research. So the challenge here, what you're really going for is to communicate your research to the public. And it is a challenge. You know, scientists are trained from the very beginning to explain their research in a very scientific 
context, right? You're always supposed to, you're, you're actually trained how to write in a essentially a new language, which is scientific <laughs> writing style. And once you get into that, it can be really, really difficult to communicate your research to the public, not only because you're used to a certain style of, of explaining and writing, um, but also because a lot of the time people don't generally understand the research. So my approach, the, the approach that I'm going to be explaining here is to first find the right framing and then translate. And I'm using translate with quotes because essentially um, you're not actually translating anything into a different language. You're translating it from scientific jargon and nuance to something that's interpretable to everyone. So what I would recommend, and um, I, I encourage you all to please pay attention here because this is going to be important. There's going to be an activity where you're actually going to do this coming up. So I want you to ask yourself, not right now, what makes your research interesting to non-scientists? That is really the core question because it's my opinion that without their attention, you achieve nothing. You, you need to first get their attention. And I think science, you know, biology, physics, engineering, math, these are all challenging topics and people generally have a hard time adhering to them or sort of really getting into them because there's this sort of a large cognitive barrier to entry. And so um, you need to not only be interesting, you know, sorry, you need to not only be interpretable, but you also need to be interesting. So I think that finding like a hook and getting them interested in some way is really important. Also, again, this is in the context of someone who's running a research project. So again, most of us are graduate students here. Um, if you have a developed project, ask yourself, what is the most compelling or impressive finding? And that can be either, you know, the most statistically significant finding that you're absolutely certain you've reproduced it multiple times in the lab, and you feel very confident that this is a real finding. Um, or it can be something that's just absolutely mind blowing people what didn't expect it, you know, the other scientists in your field are saying, whoa, that's, you know, I, I have a hard time believing that because it goes against convention. Those, those are the things that are going to be most interesting. So I think the above, the most compelling, impressive finding, and what's most interesting to non-scientists. That is your core. So now you must translate. So I think it's very important to ask yourself, what parts of your research do, would the public naturally understand and what would they not understand? And this really differs um, by each field. I think, it, you know, if you're in something like, there's new fields developing all the time. If you're in like tumor gene therapy, and nobody even knows that this stuff exists, there's going to be a lot for you to translate versus if you're studying um, social media and how it affects, you know, in like a psych psychology or a sociology context, there, there's going to be different loads of translation. So keep that in mind. And whatever the, the latter is, what they wouldn't understand, that's the part that needs to be translated. So, and we'll talk about that too. So this is a Statement, my opinion, I already said it, to successfully communicate science to the lay public, you must be both inter interesting and interpretable. So I wanna start, um, before we get into the activity with an example, I'm gonna use my research. So this was the actual project that I translated into my three minute thesis. So I'm not even gonna read this title. Uh, it's, it's neuroscience. There's a 16 feet duplication. It's a genetic mouse model of autism. GABA synapse regulator, what are GABA synapses, what's MPAS4, there's so much here. Here are some of the figures for my paper, not, not all of them, some of them. Um, so it, it just, you can imagine probably how I felt going into the three minute thesis where I'm like, what in the world am I gonna do here? How can I possibly get this, get anyone to understand this, let alone in three minutes? So I encourage everyone to break it all down. So what I looked at was, the main key points, you know, I broke my research down into the most fundamental elements. First, I had a genetic model, mouse model of autism spectrum disorder. So it was this, a, a line um, or sort of like a, a group of mice that were carrying a specific genetic mutation that's associated with autism in humans. I found that there were changes in social behavior in the mice, as you might expect, as autism affects social behavior. There are also changes in other behaviors. There was also changes in cell-to-cell -cell communication in the brains of these mice. I had a bunch of supporting biochemistry and sequencing and stuff. Then I identified a key molecule that was acting a little bit funny. It was kind of not performing its function in the brains of these mice. And, and I also found the same thing in the human um, autism 
brain tissue from human autism patients. And then finally, I found that by creating more of the protein in the brain, it made the mice more social and improved cell to cell communication. So these were like the main key points when I took out all the figures and just like, what is my paper even looking at? So does that, do we have any brave volunteers who would like to offer a suggestion? If you don't want to say it out loud, you can put it in the chat. Um, a number one through six, which of these do you think is the hook? Which is like the most compelling, most interesting part of the research? Six. I don't know who said that, but bingo. Thank you for saying that. Um, so yes, now I'm going to bold this. My animations work. Um, so this is exactly right. <clears throat> this is this is the compelling part. People are interested in, in the question of why, why is this compelling part? It's really kind of hard to articulate. It's just something human about the fact that, oh, this is very interesting that we can make the mice more social. Maybe that has implications for the treatment of the social symptoms of autism. You know, it just, it just sort of comes naturally this understanding of like what seems interesting to everyone. Because it's very clear that like number four, that's not it. <laughs> the supporting biochemistry and sequencing, that's not what everyone cares about. So exactly right. I decided to stick on number six. And in order to tell the story about six, how it made the mice more social and improved the cell-to-cell -cell communication, I had to also, sorry, I had to also tell two and three, because I had to first explain that the mice have so changes in social behavior and that they have changes in cell-to-cell -cell communication. So now starting from the top and just working down, gen the genetic model of autism spectrum disorder, I personally think I don't even need to really mention that. I need to mention that it's, that it's autism that we're talking about here, but I don't need to mention that it's a specific genetic mutation and why this mutation. Um, I think that's just overcomplicating things. Obviously, I already said this, the supporting biochemistry and sequencing, we'll leave that all out. Um, and then this key molecule that was acting strange, that I didn't bold, I didn't get rid of it because that was sort of like an intermediate that had to be explained. So I hope what you can take away from this is that it's key to break your research down into its fundamental elements and then sort of like emphasize the points that are key and get rid of the ones that you don't need. So welcome to activity one, break it all down. I'm very excited. I'm, I'm, I've never done a workshop before. I don't know if you could feel my energy, but I'm pumped. So this is an individual activity. Um, what I want you to do, I'm going to leave, the, leave this slide up so that you can um, hopefully see it while I do things. But um, what you're going to do is ask yourself, take about five minutes. This is going to be about 10 minutes of just self-work. You want to ask yourself first, what is your research all about? Define the broad topic. And why are you doing it? You know, what's the rationale? What's the impact? Um, sorry, I don't know why my... Okay. And then... Consider what framing could work for you. So what makes it interesting? What's the most compelling or impressive finding? And then what would the general public understand and what would they not? So essentially what I just did in the last slide. Um, so if you have a sheet of paper, if you have a Word document or a note open or something, um, I encourage you to begin working on this now. Then I see you're still here. So can I ask a question that perhaps will benefit like everyone um, working on their presentations? Yes, please. Um, what if you don't have, like in your research work, there was some finding that was interesting. What if there's, how do you determine like if, if you don't have sort of an outcome or a interesting finding yet because you're early in your grad work, what would you be, what would you suggest folks highlight? So I would recommend either um, doing the same activity, but presenting like your hypothesis, I suppose. Like you could still give, cause if you're in a research lab and your project is not yet developed to the point where you have um, data, I, I would assume that at least you have um, an understanding of what you might be studying. So maybe just try to present like, why are you studying it? What is your goal? And, and instead of presenting the, the hook being the most interesting finding, it would be the hypothesis and what that would mean for humanity and what, what that would mean for this field. Another option is to, um, if you don't have a research project at all, you could just present um, like a, a paper that you recently read that you like or a um, some other interesting topic that you maybe learned about recently. Uh, or if you have none of those, then you can just hang out, I suppose, and watch for the information in the slides. 
Oh, I actually meant for the competition, like if they were designing sort of for the competition, something to present. But didn't have data. Okay. Didn't yeah, have yeah. like some tangible outcome. Yeah, then I would, I would definitely say frame it as um, like, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's how I'm going to try to explain, or here, here's how I'm going to try to understand what we don't know. These are the experiments that I'm planning to run. And gotcha. um, yeah. I, then that, that makes sense for, for those in the education, humanities, social science field as well. Um, you don't always have to have like that outcome. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, very, very good point. This was helpful to kind of just lay out the foundation. And we're going to be working off of this. So the next step to this is once you've, you've got everything laid out, is you need to, like I said, translate. And I think there are many ways to do this, but one key one, which I'm going to focus on, is um, the use of analogies. So it's truly my opinion that, that analogies can help you and your audience both better understand your research. I think by trying to find a way to explain your complicated science or whatever it is you're studying um, in the context of something that everybody understands, it helps you find a good analogy and, and stick to it, which is my second point here. And what I mean by that is like when I was doing the three minute thesis, I came up with an analogy, which I'll explain in the next slide. And I've actually continued to use it every single time I've talked about not only my research, but at this topic in general. Um, and it's been so, so helpful. So I think it's really, really great to identify good analogies. And finally, I think it's important to also not oversimplify. Um, it, of course, you can assume that your audience is an expert in their topic, but you also shouldn't necessarily assume that they don't understand anything about it. I think the lay public likes to walk away with a feeling that they understand something, that they've learned something, not that they've just been explained to, and then they can't take anything with them. So um, I want to go to my example. Um, so again, I had all these figures. This is looking at synaptic transmission in the brain. So cell to cell communication, brain cells all interact with each other. Um, I had all these data, were really important findings for the study. What this is really looking at is some of you may be familiar um, with this idea of a synapse where brain cells transmit signals. And this is really critical to brain function. And I had to figure out how I wanted to explain what a synapse is. And, you know, how, this is a maybe an entire semester of education in itself, at least one lecture. How do I summarize it in 30 seconds? And so I decided to use this analogy of a traffic light. So each synapse is like an intersection with a traffic light. And so you, you think of the brain as a city, a very busy city, and red lights must be there to prevent uh, you know, traffic jams and car accidents. And then just the same, we have red lights in the brain, which are called GABA synapses, which prevent brain activity from getting out of control. So they turn down the activity of brain cells. So I found this to be a really, really effective um, analogy. And what, you know, like exactly what I just said, I don't know how long that took me, maybe, maybe 15 seconds. And that gives people a sense of understanding of, okay, I heard the word GABA synapses, maybe they won't remember it, but now they know, okay, red lights. And in my presentation, I used an image of a red light um, and an image of a synapse. So people see it together and it's like, okay, now I, I, you know, you don't want them to be lost in the sauce, basically. You want people to hang on for ideally the entire presentation, because as soon as you lose them, it's over and they're not going to understand anything after that. So in this case, I use this traffic analogy early on, and then I could just continue referring to them as red lights. But also it's important to recognize that I didn't just say there are red lights in the brain, you know, and this, and this makes brain activity less active. You know, I, I think it's important to, to, like I said, meet them in the middle, explain what a synapse is, and then say, you can think about these like red lights. So you're not oversimplifying. You're also not making it too complex. Identify, or activity two is to identify analogies. So um, it, I'm not sure why the, the text is all capitalized. I actually didn't mean to do that here. But what I want you to now do is spend a few minutes identifying the least intuitive parts of your presentation. And by your presentation, that means your research, your topic. Um, so, uh, you know, and Elizabeth did just that. She identified, okay, nobody knows what the heck T cells are, why we're using them. I think that is, is critical is to first recognize people will not understand this part of my presentation. That's perfectly okay. And then consider some appropriate analogies. So exactly what we just did. And um, let's, let's just spend a few minutes on this, maybe five to 10 minutes. Um, and then 
if anyone wants to chat, I guess I'll, I'll stay here. We can continue the dialogue. Well, no, I think that's actually a very good thing. If, you're, if your research is, um, you know, generally interpretable, then I think that's an advantage um, because you have less, that essentially gives you more time in your presentation to explain the things, the nuance that you'd like to attend to rather than spending time explaining and framing the context appropriately. So um, there probably are things that it may you know not be clear to everyone, um, but those things in your in your case may be more like the actual um, experiments that you ran and like where how you obtained participants and more of like the research side of it, like the actual statistics and the science side of it. But the good news is that that stuff all pretty much automatically gets left out of these presentations anyways, because uh, mm. it's usually not critical enough to in include in, the, in a three minute presentation or a short presentation. So, right. Um, but I just hearing you talk, I do think maybe, um, like you said, it, I found that way exactly what you'd expect to find. And then you listed those things. Um, to someone like me who has no training in this field, it's not exactly clear why I, why you might expect to find those things. Um, ah, right, th right. This this may support pre-existing published data, um, but I've never read those papers. I'm not I'm not familiar with this field, so maybe that can be um, the part that you that you focus on is you know explaining how this fits into the existing literature, and um, not only like why that's important in the context of the research, but also why that's important in, for everyone to understand and like what these underlying issues are that, that your research is seeking to address. I'm gonna, so let's come back here. I wanna provide a few other tips. Um, so, sorry, just bringing back, I'm, I'm learning how to <laughs> transition between activities and back into PowerPoint. I wanna make sure everyone's here. Um, I, yeah, I just wanna share a few other main tips, things that are, maybe obvious to some, maybe some are obvious, maybe some are not. Um, always start with a script. So I use this for both my, my TikTok videos and for my presentations. Always start with the script. And then if you have to, rehearse the script until you can just speak it without any ums or any hmms and you want it to be fluent. This also allows you to consider your timing. So if you write a script and you just start a timer and you read it aloud at the pace that you would speak out loud, gives you a sense of, okay, that took me a minute and a half to read. I, I need that section to be 45 seconds. How can I shorten it? So that's that's really key. And obviously avoid jargon where you can. Um, of course, lay the foundation first, explain only the necessary context and rationale. So a lot of the times um, people will explain like the entire research field and like, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. But, it, and then it ends up that the research only focuses on a small portion of that. And when your time is limited, when you get 60 seconds or three minutes or even five minutes, um, you are you don't need to spend a lot of time expanding upon the other context of the field, just what's really relevant to your exact research. So um, especially, so Ambreen, in your context, this one's important, consider telling a story. So I, people love stories. If you talk to like film directors, they always say like the story is key. And, and I recently met with someone and he said that he's like, you should try in your TikToks, instead of explaining research, maybe try telling a story because people, it's very compelling for people. So maybe you could try that for years is to tell a story of, maybe you could focus on one single teacher and you know it could be a made up story and explain uh, some trouble that they experienced. And then you could say, this is the research that I'm doing. I'm trying to address this and, and understand this better. Um, just, just Story, if you can incorporate it, storytelling is very powerful. So I've already mentioned this. It will be tough, but you have to abandon the norms of academic presentations. We have, fun fact actually, there was a three minute thesis tryout and I made this big complicated PowerPoint. So for the three minute thesis, you get one slide. So I had this crazy PowerPoint with all my figures on it. And I went in and I said, Hi, this is the research. I, I basically walked through my presentation 
as if I were starting with the introduction and then moving into the methods and then moving into the results and then moving into the discussion, just the same way that I would write a scientific paper. And the judges basically said, that was good. And we think that there's a lot of potential here, but this is not how you should be presenting it. You know, you need to take everything that you're learning about how to present things and abandon them and just focus on, you are telling a story, you are telling, you're conveying a message to an audience. You are not giving a scientific presentation. It's perfectly okay. And it's absolutely right to go and stand at a podium and give a scientific presentation where you lay the introduction, you lay out the methods, um, that is how you should give scientific presentations, but this is not a typical scientific presentation. This is a sort of like a TED talk. So um, you're going to have to abandon those. And when you feel yourself abandoning those, I would suggest just take a second and recognize, okay, this is uncomfortable. This feels wrong. But in the context of this competition, this is exactly what you're supposed to do. Practice is key. Of course, rehearse, like I said earlier, you can read through that script over and over. Um, but I, I, my three minute thesis presentation, I went through it so many times and I could probably do it right now, even though it was like two years ago. Um, you just, you have to practice over and over. And when you do practice, make sure you try practicing with a range of audiences. It's your friends, your family, your colleagues, grandparents are great if they're still alive. Um, I mean, it, these are the people who you should be talking to who can definitely help you understand and identify those parts that you think seem super intuitive and obvious, but to other people are like not at all clear. Um, so I would recommend, even if you don't practice with them, start by just explaining things to them. Say, hey, this is what I'm studying. What don't you understand? And then try to just get as much advice and, and, and information as you can from them. This too, when you're practicing, consider your body language and your tone, which can convey a lot of information. Um, once you do have a presentation ready, I recommend filming yourself and go walking through it and, you know, standing up and sort of, it, this is assuming that you're going to compete in the empower your pitch competition and getting closer to the actual uh, event, film yourself and just watch it back. Cause you will identify, Oh, why am I doing that weird thing where my arms are just dangling down? You know, maybe I should be moving them a little bit more. You'll, you'll notice things that are um, unusual and that you'll, it'll help you address them. And finally, it's hard, but be confident. You are the world's leading expert on your research. This is just always important when you're walking into lab meetings, when you're walking into talking to your friends about your research, when you're doing anything, you're at a conference, you are the person who knows the most about your research. There's no one who could talk about it better than you. So always stay confident and remember that because if anyone has questions, they're not they're just questions and I'm sure that you know the answer to them. So if everyone is open to it, um, I'm not sure how many people have cameras or microphones, but what I wanted to do is for the next activity is to actually do a sort of a test run and go into breakout rooms and maybe like two or three people in a breakout room and just sort of allow you the opportunity to talk through what you've come up with and, um, you know, see like, how does it feel that now you're saying it out loud? Do the other people in the room understand it? Just trying to give each other advice. So um, I, I'm, I think maybe we should give this a shot. Um, um, but as, as mentioned earlier, I use social media for science communication. And um, I always recommend that people do it. I got into it on accident. I uh, posted a video on TikTok and it went viral and it really wasn't intending to. And I ended up deciding to make it into something. And um, it, it has been really, really cool and fun. So what's the point of doing this in general? Well, of course, impact through education. I think a lot of people get into science because they want to um, make the world a better place or they want to help the world understand things. I think that, or they want to teach. Social media is a great place for that. You have this very large reach, which is awesome and exciting. Um, Another big problem, of course, is that there's misinformation everywhere. Uh, so you go on TikTok, you go on Instagram, whatever, there's always things I always see posts that are just full of misinformation, claiming things that very authoritatively, you know, the brain is made of 50 brain cells, <laughs> you know, it's like just things that are blatantly wrong. And uh, I do my best to personally address it and um, 
debunk those things. So I, I think that we need more people, more experts on there um, at answering these questions and talking about these topics. Um, so the other thing, of course, is that it allows people to connect with your esoteric academic field. I think just like what we're doing here, where we're trying to build um, a way to convey your research to people who don't understand it, um, that brings people in to something that's typically a little bit exclusive. And academic science and publishing is always a bit exclusive. You know, people can't even access the papers. So getting research out there to the lay public through social media, it can be really awesome. So and get people interested in something that they maybe didn't even know that they were interested in. What's in it for you? Well, great networking opportunities. I've met a lot of people through social media. It's been really fun and cool. Um, of course, you get a chance to build your reputation within and outside of your field. I will say that from being on TikTok and Instagram and stuff, I, when I publish a research paper, people will actually go and read the paper. Like people who shouldn't, I believe, should not care about my research will go and, and check it out, which is really, really awesome. And I am extremely grateful for people's interest. And it, it's just helped me understand that, you know, when you publish a paper, typically the only people who see it are those who work in your specific research topic um, at other universities, or maybe people at your university who see it in like a departmental email or something like that. So this brings your research into new audiences. And that's always great and uh, helpful for your career. And finally, many people may already know this, it can be lucrative. So there are financial incentives and travel and stuff and um, lots of cool things to do. So like, it's fun. I think it, th there's a lot of, there's a lot of money in social media. I think that science is a little bit, the science communication arm of social media is a little bit different. Um, there's not as much vanity and, uh, you know, it's not as, um, I guess, I don't know, like I think of LA, like Los Angeles, the people and, and like that, that's being on social media feels like being in Los Angeles, but social, the science communication part of that is a lot different. Um, and, and there's a lot of scientists on there, but you could still, you know, make money and get partnerships and stuff. There are companies, scientific companies who do brand deals on social media with scientists and stuff. So it's really cool. I'm happy to talk about that more. So um, I hope that I've convinced you to, to get involved in social media. So the next question is, okay, fine. How do I start? Well, putting yourself out there can be really awkward and uncomfortable. Um, and when I say putting yourself out there, I mean, not only going public and, you know, sharing opinions and beliefs on the internet, but also filming yourself and like stepping in front of a camera and looking at yourself on camera and hearing your voice. Um, it's really awkward at first, but practice makes perfect and you get used to it. Um, just like everything, you know, you, you, initially I was really, really awkward about like filming myself and these things, but I don't know, you just sort of acclimate to it, whether that's a good thing or not. Maybe sometimes I, I do weird things that look funny to other people, but I'm just, I don't recognize it because I'm so used to it. But um, it's, it's not as scary as you might think. Also, I was surprised to learn that my, my colleagues actually support this type of work. And I suspect that your colleagues will also, um, I, I really hid my social media for a long time. I didn't tell any of my colleagues. I didn't tell my boss. And after a while, I, it's kind of started to leak naturally. And then I decided to just tell people, and I found out that others in my field and in my department um, were very excited and, and supportive. So don't think that other scientists might mock you or look down upon you, because that's what I, I actually thought people would, would think it was silly, especially because I'm on TikTok. TikTok has sort of a, this immature um, connotation to it. So speaking of TikTok, picking a platform, if you do choose to get on social media, it's important that you choose the right platform. So, you know, there's, there's Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, all these different platforms you can use. I, I highly recommend using what you know best. So if you go on YouTube every day and, you know, that's how you unwind and at night you like to watch videos, you spend an hour and a half, two hours on there a night, post on YouTube because you already understand how the platform works. You already know what people want to see, you know, how the algorithm works. So specifically what you should be understanding about the platform is the content. What do you like to see on that app or website? So for example, on, on YouTube, there is a very specific um, sort of culture. If you, if you go on YouTube, you'll see that all the 
um, the video images, I don't know what the word for that is, like the avatar thing for the, for, for the video will always be someone's face. And they're like making this like, whoa, expression. It's like the more, like the wider your eyes and the more gaping your mouth is, the more likely someone is to click on the video. And it's like, the, t the titles are like, I went to Jamaica and then this happened. And it's like, what happened? It's like super clickbaity on YouTube. And that's like how you have to get people to click on your videos. Whereas um, on TikTok, for example, there's no such thing as that. People don't go on TikTok and scroll and, and click on a video. They just open the app and stuff starts appearing and they, you know, they, it just shows up. So you, you don't have to worry about what the avatar is or what the title is. Um, so sorry, just revisiting this. So just make sure you understand if, if you go on Instagram a lot, you already use it for your pictures, you will have a, an already sort of an inherent sense of how the platform works and, and what people look for. The audience who uses the platform, um, again, I, like I said, TikTok has sort of this immature connotation. Um, people think that it's just children. It's not. Um, I've actually been on there. I've posted videos where people commented. I, I made a video about this neuroscience research paper and someone commented and said hey that's my paper and I looked them up and it was actually the scientist who published the paper just on TikTok scrolling around watching videos and you know there are all different types of people there are older people there are, there are young people there are scientists there are lay people but the demographic shifts a bit when you move um, I, I have like a continuum in my head it's like TikTok is over here on like the super general lay public and then it move you move to instagram and you get like a little bit of scientists a lot of the general public then you move to twitter and there's like a lot of scientists and the, the lay public but scientists have sort of like built their own little circles on certain apps like twitter where a lot of scientists use it and other apps are less colonized by scientists like TikTok. So you just have to be aware of, of who are you speaking to. And again, if you already use that platform, you probably have a good sense of that. And then finally, the algorithm. So what performs best? Like I was saying on, on YouTube, you have to make this crazy facial expression to be successful with the video. Um, on Instagram, you know, reels do really well and photos do well, but long, long form videos don't do as well on, on TikTok. Um, you have to understand like what exactly about the algorithm chooses whether or not a video goes viral. This is the one that takes the most time to learn. And again, a good reason why you should already use the platform and have a good understanding of it going in. So how to start, what I recommend to people is to just start by writing a script, you know, just make a, make a video script, just write something down. And people might say, well, I don't know what to talk about. Try talking about your favorite paper or your favorite research topic, um, or you can talk about your own research if you want. But I really, really recommend, and even if you're not, well, if, if you are at all interested in social media, getting and doing videos and stuff, this is what I would suggest. Write a script, film it. So film yourself speaking that script. There's absolutely no pressure to post at all. Just see what it feels like to take a video. Practice using the app. You know, if it's TikTok, try using the different effects. Just get a sense for everything, you know, like when you're when you're filming yourself and you move the camera this way and like your head moves the other way, just like getting a sense for how it feels and the different types of things you can do on there. Um, there's sort of a learning curve, but you have to start somewhere and you might find, wow, this is actually really fun. I really like exploring these effects. Maybe you have an interest in like photography or videography and you find that it's really fun and satisfying. And then ultimately you can post or not post. It's totally up to you. Um, if you feel comfortable, go ahead and post it. Most likely when you film your very first video, you're gonna think, ooh, this is really awkward. I don't like the way I look. I don't like the way I sound. And you may not post it. But if you if you like the way it turns out, then go for it. And if you do, I think it's sometimes start, easier to start with a personal audience. So you could try um, you know, posting it on your the Facebook account where you just your family is on there or something, you know, and just sort of see how people respond to it and maybe try and get feedback from those people. Um, and ultimately, I think unless you're starting on TikTok where it's the whole purpose is to really like go viral, you're almost always going to be starting with a personal audience as it is, because otherwise there's really no way to recruit people to pay attention unless you're promoting it 
through your personal uh, accounts. And then finally, when you're ready, if you are ready to eventually make your own, you know, so really start doing this, I strongly recommend starting a new account. Um, that's just my personal advice. I, I recommend to save your personal account. So I really thought about doing it on my personal, like using my personal Instagram account, but I didn't. And I'm really glad I didn't because now I have like this sort of sacred Instagram that I can go and like see my friends and family and, and you know, like get away from uh, the whole like social media influencer thing, which can be kind of overwhelming at times. So um, I want to talk about my specific approach. So I have this video that I don't think it plays until the end. Yeah. So I want to talk about my content creation process. So personally, as a scientist, I always build from peer reviewed literature. In the beginning, I started out by just um, like saying things that I thought were true and like, oh, I remember learning this in college. I'm going to make a video about this. And then I realized that I could be unintentionally spreading misinformation. So nowadays, um, by the way, I don't think I did, but it, it occurred to me that I just assume these things to be true just because I hold these beliefs and I learned them at one point doesn't mean that they're necessarily still true today. So when I make a video nowadays, especially as a person who's hoping to educate the public about science, I always start with the literature, make sure that everything I'm saying is, is valid and I have evidence to support it. Just like the three minute um, presentation, the empower your pitch thing we're talking about, same thing. I, I start by identifying the most important or the most interesting features to focus on. It's critical. You have to get the audience's attention. Then you have to decide on how to make it interpretable. So that's the whole translation piece, which is, you know, another challenge. Um, that's those two points are probably the biggest of everything. It's again, making it interpretable, making it interesting. Using good images in videos. Um, so videos do really well. People like to watch things. I, I use videos in this video that I'm about to show. Um, that, that always seems to perform pretty well. And I can talk about that more in a little bit. Be relatable and be respectful. I, I see some people who wear a lab coat when they're doing science communication. I personally don't. As you can see in this video, I'm wearing a t-shirt. I think it's important to just sort of convey this sense of, I know these things that I'm talking about them because I think they're interesting, but not, I'm here to educate you and you should listen to me because I have this lab code and thus I'm an authority. I think people want you to be relatable and, and respectful of their level of understanding and their knowledge base. Um, and then finally, since I'm on TikTok, TikTok's algorithm depends upon viewing time. So I always start with a hook. So I, you have to get them interested on TikTok specifically, if you can get them over like the first five to 10 seconds, um, then people have this sort of cognitive investment where they're, well, I already sat through 10 seconds of this video. I should probably sit through the rest. Uh, so let me play this video and hopefully the sound will work. This research paper just came out in the prestigious journal Science and it's literally an analysis of squirrel parkour. I love science. I mean, look at this. The researchers wanted to figure out how squirrels make decisions about the leaps that they make between trees like this right here. Look at this squirrel. Look at him swinging around. How cute. When a squirrel is making a jump between branches, it can either jump from the base of the branch, like right here, where it's much more stiff, or further out where it's a lot more flexible. So the scientists created three artificial branches with different levels of flexibility, also known as compliance. And they found that on the more flexible branches, like this one, the squirrel jumped from closer to the branch point, even though it had to cover a greater distance. This means that the squirrel's decision is partially influenced by the branch's flexibility. And now the moment you've been waiting for, squirrel parkour. They found that the squirrels jumped off the walls like this for longer leaps to improve the accuracy of their landing. But my favorite part of this study is that these were not lab animals. These were wild squirrels that they recruited with peanuts. Follow for more cool science. So th uh, that video was about squirrels, not neuroscience. Um, but I love the video. And one of the reasons why I like that video so much is because it incorporates these images of these squirrels jumping. And whatever, there's a whole conversation to be had here about why are people interested in watching squirrels jump when you can literally look out the window and watch the same thing. Um, but I'll admit that paper was not easy to understand. That was a science paper. And, you know, that's a, they do a lot of robust analyses. Um, so I actually did have to work pretty hard to, th to figure out how to like condense this all and interpret it and then make it fun and interesting. Um, so I, I hope that it illustrates a bit of my approach where I, I start with a hook, you know, like squirrel parkour. People, people want to hear about squirrel parkour, I think. That sounds kind of cool. Those two words you don't hear combined. Um, and then you have to explain the foundation of like, why does this matter? Like, what's 
what's the point of squirrels jumping around? Um, so I just wanted to show that 60 second video to, to give a, some context of that. So overall pros and cons of doing science communication, um, a lot of these things go hand in hand. So first pro, it can be extremely satisfying and lucrative. Myself, I'm interested in a career in education. So I wanna, I've want i always wanted to be a professor. This is an opportunity for me to, to practice teaching and, and engage in teaching. So I find it really fun and satisfying and lucrative, but it can also be very challenging and taxing. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, I, the nice thing is that you have full control over how much time you put into it. Um, I find that social media can, has this sort of weird allure to it where you start posting often. And then if you stop posting, like your follower count starts to go down. And I actually think that the platform's build in a lot of mechanisms to try to retain you as a creator like like they i don't no idea how but they recommend that people unfollow you or something or like me i noticed on instagram they'll like show you your least interacted with accounts and it's like that seems like a cue to unfollow those people so i think maybe if you stop posting for a few days it'll like put them put you in there so um it, it can be taxing and, and challenging because you think oh i need to be posting all the time and especially when you're doing science content, it you know you can't just film a video in a minute. Um, one 60 second video can take several hours or more of research and writing the script and finding the images and editing the video and stuff. So um, there's a lot that goes into it. There are many neat opportunities that come from it, like this, for example. I'm honored to be have been invited by Futures to to give this presentation. So there's uh, a lot of cool things that that you get involved with, but again, it takes a lot of time. So um, you know, it's a balance and you have to make decisions about like what you want to do. This is really fun. I'm glad I'm doing this, but there are other times where I have to turn things down because I, I simply don't have the time. Um, also balancing, you know, my lab work. Um, another con is that you're putting yourself out there. Your reputation is at risk. So if you, you know, you see it all the time with celebrities doing things and people attack them and judge them. Um, and just by putting yourself out there, you know, you, you become vulnerable to attacks. But the good thing is that people have extremely short memory. So if you if you say something in a video, I've had things happen. I've been involved in multiple controversies as a content creator, small things, you know, nothing huge, but controversies nonetheless. And I thought, man, this is going to be terrible. People are going to think about this forever. And then people just completely forget. It's very strange. So <laughs> it's not really, as long as you don't do anything like super terrible, uh, you're fine. And then another pro is that you have this ability to reach a global audience, which is, of course, amazing. But the downside of that is that the internet is rude. And um, I'm going to show an example of that in the next slide. But um, the anonymity of social media tends to make people mean. And I strongly recommend if you ever get any mean comments or anything like that, just do not respond. That is definitely the way to approach it. Um, by engaging, you only aggravate them further and then you get sucked into it. Not a good idea. Now, I want to take this opportunity to invite you all to write a video script. And this doesn't have to be an actual TikTok video script, but, um, and I know that not everyone's interested in doing a TikTok, but I want to give you the opportunity to think about how you might frame everything that we've worked on from the first couple of activities into a roughly 60 second like pitch, you know, and, and you can use bullet points if you'd like, but I really just want to give you the chance to think about like, what are the key points? And if you had to distill absolutely everything about your, your presentation into 60 seconds, what would you include? So just take a few minutes. Let's just do like five minutes on this. Um, and then we'll come right back. So I'm going to start a timer. So with the hook, I think you want to try to, the best hook, in my opinion, is starting with a short summary of the most interesting part. And like, if you're, if you're going to tell a story that's going to build up to some cool discovery, you're, you can't bet on them sitting and waiting through all the foundational information to get to that part that's interesting. You need to tell them, hey, I'm going to explain this cool thing. And if you give me 60 seconds, we're going to get there and you're going to understand it. 
Um, and, and they need to know that up front. So if you say, scientists just discovered blah, 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 whatever it is, and then you start explaining it, that gives them a reason to, to stay with you. So uh, I think that's the easiest hook of all is when you can identify the most interesting thing and just say, this is what I, this is what this is all about. So, and then in your case, the, um, those analogies are helpful, I guess, enzymes along the way to help um, them understand what you're explaining in, in the context of the research. So, um, I always recommend these tips. Every word counts. And this is again why a script helps. I think when you when you say I'm going to make a video about something and then you start filming yourself and you just talk to the camera, you're very likely to add fluff words and take time to think about things and stuff. Um, and what could have been a 60 second video is now a minute and 20 second video. And so you're you're waiting there's 20 extra seconds for people to sift through you thinking for the right words and things like that and saying um, um every word is important and also the the choice for every word is critical um so instead of saying neuron maybe say brain cell do people know what brain the neurons are so think strategically about your word choice in terms of both duration of how long it will take you to say that and interpretability um also think about what visuals could be used to aid the presentation maybe i'm wrong this is just my opinion but i think you need to be strategic and thoughtful so if you're using the synapse and traffic light analogy that i was talking about earlier i would say that you should show a synapse on the screen not a traffic light the inclination might be to show a traffic light but Viewers already know what a traffic light looks like, but they don't know what a synapse looks like. So I think if you can show them, this is what a synapse looks like, you could think of it like a traffic light. It's easy for them to picture the traffic light in their head, but if you show them a traffic light, who knows what they're going to picture in their head for a synapse. So I wouldn't be over technical with your imagery, but um, if you can pair an, an unclear, inaccessible image with an analogy, that aids the learning process, in my opinion. Um, don't make yourself vulnerable, not, not to like criti criticize, critique or attacks, but to like logical flaws. I think you should address all the questions that you can or don't leave clear logical holes in your, in your presentation. Um, I think maybe don't make yourself vulnerable was the wrong phrasing to use here. But um, if you're telling a story and you make a huge jump in the middle of it for like, they, they asked this question and then they went to the, study this question and people don't really understand why. That's not only gonna be confusing for people, um, but also people are gonna start to just lose interest and in, in, um, once you lose their attention, again, you lose everything. So let's see, okay. All right, so now, we're not actually gonna do this one. This is the final activity, but you can do this on your own um, afterwards. But psych, <laughs> you have three minutes now. So the purpose was with the 60 second video, the goal was to force you to distill your research into its most fundamental components. And what are the absolutely necessary pieces that would have to be included in a 60 second presentation? But now if you have three minutes, how might you revisit your script and, and choose to introduce key points that you had to exclude due to the time constraints? So I think, this is an opportunity for you to think about your, your research in different time frames and what might you do with those extra two minutes? Would you expand on certain phrases to make things more clear? Would you introduce entirely new experiments or discoveries or a foundational knowledge that you had to leave out? You know, what could you do with the extra time to make things more accessible and exciting for the viewer? And the goal is to build your empower your pitch script using what you've learned.